You had to come sit in my seat. Uh, my name is Zena and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you so very much. It is such an, a huge honor to be asked to share anywhere um, about my experience, strength and hope. Um, and, and it is truly an honor to be received by you guys. So thank you so much for giving me just a little bit of your time. Um, I, I am here. So I, I have a little dog. He's my protector. He, he only about this big. Literally every car that drives down the street, she's going to bark. So I apologize in advance for her great protection. You know, um, God's covering is a lot more quieter than hers. <laughs> but then again, his power is much greater. So um, that's just my disclaimer. Uh, you know, anytime I share my experience, strength, and hope, um, I, I am quite comfortable with allowing God to do whatever he's going to do since I finally, uh, finally, finally, after years and years and years of attempting not to, I finally understand that I don't get to choose about that anyway. And so uh, to be able to relax and just uh, settle into whatever God is going to share um, through, through with you through me, um, I, 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 I I, <laughs> I get excited about. However, my conversations with Teresa this week got me a little apprehensive. I was like, who are these people? Are these like your average alcoholics? You know, are, are they like extraordinary alcoholics? These are regular drunks, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, my sobriety date is 9288. And um, and I was introduced to this information through a different fellowship. However, my experience with the 12 steps does come from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I, 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 I'm very big on respecting the house that I am in. I understand that I am in an alcoholic house. Uh, I, um, and I pray that because my story is not always alcoholic specific, that you will be patient with me should I not be able to um, uh, speak it in that way. Luckily for me, we talk about step 11, and in step 11, uh, they don't care what substance it is. It's like in step 11, do you know God or no? <laughs> That's the question. Do you know God or no? That's the question. You know, um, I do want to qualify just a little bit to let you know I didn't show up like this with my hair comb and my clothes clean on time and speaking in complete sentences. Uh, when I when I when I made it to the detox unit in Pomona, California, in uh, September of 1988, uh, I was I was caught I was caught by surprise uh, by the reflection in the mirror that I saw because it was the first time I had disrobed um, in front of a mirror in I, you know I can't say when I don't know if it was days weeks or months I know it wasn't days that's not true it wasn't day it absolutely had not been days it had to have been either weeks or months that I had disrobed completely in front of a mirror um, or taken a shower and so um, you know the the uh, the gasp at the reflection in the mirror um, was was quite surprising. Uh, I did not recognize my own reflection. I, I was taken aback by the condition I had done to the temple that's the day I called my body. Um, and all I could do is um, I collapsed in tears at what I had done to myself and, and also in confusion because I didn't know how I had done that, uh, nor did I know uh, did I see it coming on? There was absolutely no clue um, to the condition. And I was gray from dehydration and ash, and I, I had no hair. I was three shades darker. And the disease of alcoholism was very, very apparent on my physical self. Um, and that was just an inkling of what had occurred at the spiritual level. Uh, I was uh, emotionally and um, mentally and physically bankrupt. Um, and, 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 and at a loss. Um, but I set out on this road of recovery and, and I committed to uh, giving it all that I had available initially to prove that it didn't work. That was, that was my first motivation. It's like, you guys are tripping. This don't really work like y'all say it do. 
because uh, I was raised with a God of my understanding. It was just a little bit skewed because my grandmother was a Christian minister. My father was a Muslim minister. And those two religions don't always mix. Um, uh, <laughs> but they gave me a great base for who I am today. Cause today I don't hold judgment on what religion you practice. Um, do you know, I, I go back to my original question, do you, you know God or not? <laughs> and I'm gonna say that a lot. Do you know God or not? Um, and, and for those of you who don't understand my little, my little uh, slang is yes or no. <laughs> Just in case, because you never know who's listening. You know, I don't want nobody to be left behind. Uh, do you know God? Yes or no? So, you know, um, uh, step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. There came a time in my recovery where, because um, my life was always chaotic. I have five adult children today, but when I first got sober, the youngest was two and the oldest was 12, three girls um, and two boys, and I was a single parent. So my life was always chaotic. Um, and I came in here with, with, with a lot of the... Mm, the, the, a lot of a lot of the representation of low self-esteem and, and low self-worth, uh, not really valuing who I am as an individual or a human being very much. Uh, and so, but the day came, and I, I can't remember when. I don't know if it was at ten years, twelve years, fifteen years. It was before twenty years, but somewhere in the first twenty years, the day came where I was sitting in my home and 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 life was quiet. Um, life was so quiet that um, that the silence was deafening, and I thought that I was uh, having some kind of strange. Uh, mental breakdown, which by the way, I did have in recovery, but that's not this meeting. If you'd like to know more about that, we can talk at another time. Um, but on this day, I called one of my girlfriends that are in my support system. Um, get a support system before you need it, because when you need it, you won't get it. And so luckily for me, I had a support system in place. And on this day that I thought I was losing my mind, because I thought I was hearing voices in that silence, I called one of the girlfriends and I said, you know, I think something's wrong. She's like, what, what's going on? And I was like, nothing. She was like, well, what are you feeling? I was like, nothing. She was like, well, is anything happening? I was like, no. She was like, what's in your environment? I said, nothing. She said, Zena, uh, I think that's peace. <laughs> I had never experienced quiet uh, uh, that I can remember at any point. And so it was quite disturbing to be in an environment where there was no drama, no chaos, no trauma, no screaming, no, you know, no alcohol, no parties, no kids, no, you know, it was, it was quiet. And, and so we laughed and laughed and laughed because we, from the moment she said it, I was like, ah, uh, I bet this is peace, you know, if you don't have a reference, you don't have a reference, you know, and you're not going to know until you know. And I have been working these steps for a number of years at that point, but it had never been that freaking quiet, man. And I really thought I, I wanted to cry, but I didn't have any tears. So I thought there was something very wrong. And it was my experience with my first experience with peace. Um, and, and I determined at the end of the day, I didn't like peace. It was too doggone quiet. Who wants to be this? That's like, no, I, I, you know what? This is unsettling. I, I don't want to be this freaking peaceful. Can I get something going on? Cause you know, anyway, um, so that was my first experience with peace. Uh, I cannot remember the first time that, uh, that it occurred to me that the 11th step came in two parts. Uh, well, it came in multiple parts. Uh, I, I, always, I, I always resonated with the part that says soft through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. And even though the sentence continues, you know, the step continues from there, that's always where I stop. So I was always in this seeking place. I was always looking for something. You know, I knew I had the Muslim God. My father talked about the Christian God. My grandmother talked about. I had ex I had um I had done you know amateur study on 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 the on metaphysics and things like that. I had done a little bit of yoga. I had done a little bit of martial arts, which is a religion all in itself. You know, I, I had I had done this seeking 
process where I was looking and looking and looking, you know, for a God to understand. And, 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 um, it hit me like a ton of bricks, probably in book study one day when, um, when it was quiet and someone was reading it and, and it, and it occurred to me, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. I was like, you know, I keep looking outside of myself. I have this God-sized hole in my gut that I keep trying to fill with everything but God. You know, I want to fill it with, when I, when I was drinking, I tried to fill it with alcohol and that worked until it didn't. And when it didn't, I found you guys. And when I found you guys, I understood I couldn't drink anymore, but I, I still didn't know what to fill my God-sized hole with. I didn't even understand that it was a God-sized hole. I just knew that there was an emptiness that I, that I experienced all the time with consistency, and I didn't know how to offset that. All the steps didn't seem to address it. Working with others didn't seem to address it. Um, being of service didn't seem to address it. Um, you know, it, these, these things would, would set it to the side momentarily, but it would never, it would, I, I would never have a consistent a feeling of just being at peace or stable, so to speak, is what I've learned to call it now. Um, and 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 as I uh, traveled through this thing called recovery, you know, I've tried filling it with food. I've tried filling it with sex. I tried filling it with all the altruistic activity of helping others. And I've come to know that that can be codependent, which is a whole nother conversation that we don't have to talk about here. But that's what it wound up in me because my alcoholic mind will, will address everything that I engage in alcoholically so anything that I get into will work that work I will continue to try to feed off of that and get that thing to keep working over and over and over again because I for a very long time did not know I was trying to fill a God-sized hole with all these other things in that God-sized space nothing can fill it but God that's it. That's all. There's no other way around that. And so um, for anyone who's not, who is not tapped into uh, a power greater than yourself or, or an understanding of a God, don't trip. Just hold your seat. <laughs> I say, hold your seat. He got you covered whether you know who he is or not. So don't trip. Just hold your seat. Hold tight. Don't drink no matter what. Um, um, but um, when I when I was able to label the that emptiness as a God sized whole, I began to understand God from a totally different mindset, from a totally different perspective. And it adjusted the way that I did my seeking. I didn't seek outside myself anymore. I began to find um, um, uh, practices that would um, that could be conducted just me by myself in the in the art of being still, um, which was new. Even in recovery, it was new to be still because racing thoughts were habitual for me. If I didn't have racing thoughts, I thought I was going crazy. So it, it took some adjustment to get accustomed to having my brain slow down, to having my heart rate slow down, to having moments where there is absolutely nothing going on and knowing that everything is good. You know, uh, that was the first knowledge that I had when Teresa asked me about the topic, the reason why I wanted to talk about knowledge and power is because it took some years of undoing who I had become through all of my alcoholic behavior before, during, and after that first drink. It took some undoing. Of, 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 of the things that I had put in place trying to fill that God-sized hole with everything except God. And so just knowing, when I look to the side, I got my book over here, so uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not distracted, but just knowing his will, I, I, I 
finally, when I heard the rest of the steps, <laughs> it's so weird how the brain will only resonate with pieces and parts of information. I can only imagine the secrets my brain is holding from me right now, just from all the things I've discovered it was holding from me before. It's like, you wasn't gonna tell me, you just gonna leave me out here all exposed without no knowledge, but okay, you know, again, a whole nother story that we can have another time. But you know, when I took that second half, because I had spent years with the first half, I took that second half and I began to just pray for knowledge. It wasn't even God's will. It was just knowledge because I have been operating from places of ignorance. I was surprised to find out that my emptiness was a God-sized hole. And I was surprised that I was a full-blown, grown adult with almost grown kids, several exes, and a whole bunch of living before that information became a part of my awareness. It's like, well, dang, how long I got to live? Please don't let me die before I find out the rest that's going to allow me to live a life of peace and serenity. It's like, you, I, anyway, uh, me, me, me and my God, I love him to death because he let me just talk to him from who I am. And, and I'd be like, bruh, what's up <laughs> with what's going on right now? I am not happy. Do you know? You know, that's how that's how me and God get down. We get down like that because you know what? He's my friend today. And today our friendship is solid and we can talk just natural like that. But um, when I was nurturing that friendship, I, my prayer life was just about knowledge. You know, help me with my awareness. Help me to just understand what I'm coming into the awareness of. And help me not beat up on myself for not being aware of it prior to the moment that I, I discovered it. And then I went from there to having knowledge of his will for me. And, you know, that was um, a process of me thinking, you know, do I make this decision? Do I make that decision? Is this God's will? Is this God's will? Well, these voices I hear in my head, is that me? Is that God? Is that my mother? Is that my grandmother? Is that all the conversations y'all? I'm telling you, schizophrenia is like rampant in my, in my existence. It's like, I look regular, but it's a gang of people sitting in this, in this chair, only dressed in my clothes and my face right now in front of y'all but it's okay because I've learned to be still. <laughs> I tell everybody, take a seat. We had a meeting. Don't say nothing. We got things to do. But, um, you know, uh, I, 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 it, was, it was through that process of, of asking, which is what my prayer is, uh, me asking God to please help me in one area or another, um, whether it's understanding, discovery, you know, whatever. Um, it was in that process of asking, you know, when I would hear these various conversations, I learned to say, okay, God, is that you? Is that me or is that them? You know, and strangely enough, there would always be indicators to, uh, to let me know um, that it was him. And when it wasn't him, because generally I used to think that if it was scriptural, you know, if it's in the Bible, then that must be him, you know, because that's what the Christian religion will tell you. If you want to know if the thought you're thinking is a God thought, check it against the word of God. Well, what about people who are not Christians? Do God not talk to them too? You know, I, that that's the question AA taught me to ask. You can't tell me that my only verification is biblical when I know a gang of God-fearing people who are not Christians. So y'all yeah, got to come. I was like, thank you for sharing. Yeah, who do I get my answers from? Because these people are trying to steer me in the wrong direction. You, did, did you hear what they said? You know, he's like, I heard them, Zena. You're good. Let's just keep you and me. I'm like, okay. Um, so what I discovered, <laughs> and this is my own Thank you. This is my own. Um, I created this idea for myself because it works for me. The, the will of God in my life is anything I want that is good, that is right, that is loving, that is kind, that is tolerant. And, and, and whatever that thing is, uh, be it in the physical realm or the spiritual realm, the verbal realm, whether it's just me to myself or me with others or me with the world, um, God will bless it if I, if 
the big book says, I can go anywhere that a free man can go if my motives are right. God's will will always be whatever my right motive is trying to do. Even if I do it in the wrong way, because that's all I know. For me, God is patient with me getting an understanding. Because what I discovered, y'all, and I'm, I'm going to just get close because I think it's kind of like a secret. What I discovered is we, we in this until death. And when I get it absolutely perfect, I'm going to lay on down because I'm going to be done. So if this is a lifetime situation, why I'm in a hurry to know all the answers today? Get, give yourself a break. It ain't got to be all today. you got to the day you die to get it right. And, and as long as you keep trying from now to the day you die, then you, you end the game and you batter up, batter up, we got it. If God is not tripping. At least that's what it is for me. Um, and then to go on, um, to, when I was able to understand that, that uh, and the book was so freeing because it gave me an opportunity to create my own conception, the conception that works not just with me, but it, it works with me and my personality. It works with me and all the voices. It works with me and all of my insecurities. It works with me. It works with who I am and how I'm twisted. Um, my conception works with me because I'm not always normal. <laughs> and how freeing was it for me when I finally was okay with people who are normal are not normal. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I can relax. So that's um, the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. I know I was at least 15 years sober before it occurred to me that knowledge was not enough. I thought since I had acquired this grand, you know, altruistic behavior, you know, to, uh, get, to go to God for the knowledge of his will for me, um, and then I would self-will myself the power to carry the stuff out. And it's like, imagine having the heart for God to do the right thing from a place of love, kindness, and tolerance for the people that you encounter, and you keep getting punched, or you keep getting sucker punched, or you keep getting knocked off off your rocker or you keep being accused of, of having a different motive when that's not your motive, you know, and, and the rest of the stuff, the knife step uh, did very well for uh, keeping me from causing harm because I, I do not like having to go and say sorry, especially to people who have hurt me. Um, but I've done all that work and, and so I'm very, uh, I'm very quick to hold my tongue. But I couldn't understand why I kept being, not attacked, but I, I kept having poor outcomes um, when it came to me doing what I considered to be the right thing. And I couldn't figure out why are my outcomes not as beautiful as my motivation? Why don't I see the evidence of everything that I'm desiring to give? And it occurred to me because I was operating from my own personal power. I, I would access God for the knowledge, but I forgot to ask him for the power to carry it out. It's like, oh, wait, oh, <laughs> oh, that's still self-will wrong, right? I, mm, I, I, that one went over my head, hit the wall, and had to come back. Um, for me to get it. And so uh, when, when Teresa asked me about my topic, knowledge and power are so big to me because today I understand, today I understand that um, asking for the knowledge of God's will for me um, is, is an incomplete prayer until I, I finish my sentence and ask for the power to carry it out. Because when, when it's a dangerous thing to have an alcoholic with substantial time have the knowledge of God's will, and then they set out on um, they, they set out on their own self power to carry out God's will. And how demanding can we be when people don't want to surrender to the God's will? 
will we keep telling them that, that I'm trying to expose? Don't you know I'm trying to give you God's will right? Why are you fighting so hard? It's like trying to force the little old lady across the street when all of her business is on the side she's standing on. And you know, it's like, and she's screaming, you know, help, help, I'm, I'm being kidnapped. And we're like, Be, quit fighting, lady. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you, lady. It's the same concept. You get her across the street just to find out, oh, you weren't trying to come here my bad. I, I was trying to be altruistic with you. <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to help, uh, you know, but um, the, so having the power to carry out God's will sometimes means standing down and doing nothing when, it, when I think I have the answer. Um, and if I didn't learn that nowhere, I learned that with five grown kids of an alcoholic, me. Uh, because my five adult children who were raised by me who did not have the benefit of being taken by child services and put into a healthy environment, they, had, they stuck it out. They were in my disease with me um, from beginning to the end. And, um, <laughs> and their personalities display that today. But um, they're just now starting to get to the side of me that was part of recovery because for a long time all they looked like was the alcoholic me um, but when the pop when when knowing that god is in charge and even though i have the answer but no one has asked for my assistance Reminding my ego that it doesn't get to bulldoze people with solutions they have not requested becomes the work of the 11th step for me. Being able to sit still in all my knowing and understand that it's God power that will make this different, right, better, or other than what I'm looking at not Xena power. Uh, but being able to adopt that behavior, that mindset, that way of life, that practice of prayer and meditation, prayer, me talking to God, asking God questions, sharing my fears with God, sharing all of my challenges with God, all of the my concerns, all of of everything I, I have going on. And then my meditation of being quiet, being still, listening for uh, his voice, listening for indicators of, of the direction he would prefer I go into. List, it is a dialogue for me and God in the 11th step. It is not a monologue. It's not a monologue from me to God. And it's not a monologue from God to me. It is a dialogue. We nurture our relationship. And, and, and I had to understand that I wanted to know, I, want, I wanted to know God. I wanted to know the personality of God for myself. And I used to say, and I wanted God to know me. <laughs> Today, I understand the arrogance of that idea. You know, God knew me before I got here. He knew me already. And so today, I, my desire is that I know the personality of God. And I know that God knows me. Um, and, and that is the up level of 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 the 11th step for me. It's how I continue uh, in the practice uh, of enlarging on my spiritual life and, and knowing that it, it's imperative that I continue to increase that activity um, as the years go on because the longer I stay sober, the farther away from the last one that I get, which diminishes the level of desperation, which was a great motivating factor at the beginning. Um, and so today, being this distance from the last one, it's imperative that I increase 
enlarge and improve on my spiritual relationship with God. Because just like um, I've been sober in two weeks, on September 2nd, I will have 32 years. And I don't say if it be God's will. It is God's will. It is not God's will that I be drunk. <laughs> it's God's will that I be sober. So if I cooperate with God from now until September 2nd, I will have 32 years. That's it. But um, um, uh, with 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 the um, with the amount of, with 32 years between me and my last uh my last pickup the level of desperation because also i've had a number of years in a row where i experienced peace and joy and stability i experienced a sense of calm in chaos i i i, I am not I can't say I'm not affected by what's going on, but I am not disturbed to the point of disruption in my emotional regulation by what's going on in the world today. Um, my level of peace has been consistent in our current climate in the world today. And that's because of the work that I've done in this book. Um, it's also because as the years go by, I continue to enlarge upon my spiritual life. And what that looks like in practical activity is I don't just read the big book. I don't just read the Bible. I don't just read the Quran. I, I read other spiritual books, but I also ask, in what ways, God, can I up-level our relationship and and you to put this in layman's turn if god were my man i'd be like how we keep it se sexy after 32 years what we got to do different you know do i need to put on lingerie so you still be attracted to me well you know do i have to put on a different purpose because i don't want my man to get bored same thing i don't want god getting bored with me i don't want to be bored with god and i treat it the same way you know just like if, if he were my man, I would want to uh, keep things new and exciting between us in our relationship. Same thing with God. I want my relationship with God to be new and exciting and fresh. I don't want God to be going around going, yeah, that's, that's Zena. That's, yeah, that, that's my woman. <laughs> yeah, this, okay, I'm God and this is, this is Zena. Yeah, I want God to be like, you know, I'm God, and this is my woman, Zena. <laughs> I want her to be excited that I am who I am in the way that I walk the earth, you know. Um, and so um, right now, I am, and, and I have um I have an accountability partner doing this with me because I've learned that support always makes things better. Um, but I am reading A Course in Miracles. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that particular book. It's not the big book, but it does enlarge my spiritual life. So she's my accountability partner with that. My sponsor who reads a, 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 a uh, number of different authors has me reading this other book, Heinz Feet to High Places. And it's about a little girl named Much Afraid who comes from the Valley of Fearings. You know, I'm like, dang, you know, she, and, and, and she's trying to get to the mountain high, but she has a club foot and a dead eye. And it's like, you know, how do I go? She has to go through the, she has to go through the land of beautiful to get there. And you must be beautiful to enter. But, you know, she's like, I can't go with this club foot and this ugly eye. And she asked the shepherd who I identify as God. God, you know, how do I get there? And he's like, you know, keep, uh, trust me, you have to trust me. Uh, I can't go with you because I move too fast. I will give you two comforters. The comforters God gave her was suffering and sorrow. This book is ridiculous. But, you know, if that is not my life as a freaking alcoholic, I don't know what is. It's like suffering and sorrow taught me humility. It taught me to be humble. It taught me to be patient. It taught me to just like wait a minute you know suffering and sorrow may not be comfortable but they are such great teachers and if i'm patient in it i can i can get through it with grace you know if i just it's like oh is this the path that you would have me walk okay i'm a grass hole of the hands of suffering and sorrow my mom just died my mom died in december my mom had alzheimer's for six years and and i watched her deteriorate for that period of time and it's like there's a picture of me the day before she went into the hospital the uh, 
that last time of which she never came out. There's a picture. I'm sitting on her couch with her and she's just leaning. She's leaning on me and she's rocking from side to side and my brother is sitting across and I'm looking at her and, and her words are garbled now. So she can talk still and she can convey a message, but she can't really communicate because her brain is deteriorated just to that degree. And I look up to my brother and I said, do you know that this is it? God is not going to cause her to suffer. He's only held her here this long so that you and I have an opportunity to get our stuff together so that we can lay her down with respect and integrity the way she lived without having to do fish dinners and go fund me pages. And so now that we've got our stuff together and we're, are you ready? And my brother was like, no, man, I'm not ready. I'm like, are you ready? Cause she's tired. She's done. She's done. There's no more left in her and she's not who we know. And sure enough, she was, only, she was only down for 14 days in the hospital, but that 14th day, they had her on a, a resp respirator and they were going to trach her. And I said, no, we're gonna do hospice and get her ready. And, and I had planned this big family party in the, in the ICU. My mother hated lots of people and loud noises, but I, I was like, me and my kids and my brother, we was gonna do this big party. We had planned it for 12 o'clock. We were gonna take her off the ventilator. They were gonna make her comfortable and we were just gonna stay until the end. At four o'clock that, that morning, they called, they was like, it's done. And all I could think of is my mother said, didn't I tell you I don't want no damn party? <laughs> I know you're not bringing all these people. You know what? I'm out of here. I told you don't be bringing all these people. And, and as, as much as it hurt, because my mother's my heart, I, I mean, that was my dog. As much as it hurt, I could not. I was like, when they called, I said, hello. And they said, Miss Stefter, I said, she's gone, isn't she? And then she, she said, yeah. I said, did, did she just leave? They's like, yeah. I said, me, me and my son are on our way. I hung up the phone and I'm like, all right, Ma, you win. You win. I, my bad. I thought we was having a party. She was like, no. I said, no, I'm done. You know, but only, only with the peace of God was I able to, to sustain in that sorrow, in that suffering, and have joy unspeakable to know that she was free, and we were free. And what she did is she lived her life in a way that made sure that we were good from now on, me, my brother, and my children. Not even financially, but she equipped us with the tools and the talents and the know-how to get things done and handle our business. And so, you know, um, I, if you wanna know what all this has to do with step 11, this is my elevation. It started right here with me seeking through prayer, talking to God, meditation, listening to God to improve my conscious contact with God as I began to understand him, which I understand him as one who has me covered no matter what I think, no matter what I feel, and no matter what it looked like on the outside, I am covered. I am good. Even when it hurts, I am covered. I am good. When I don't, when I, when I don't like what I'm looking at in my life, I begin to say out loud so my ears can hear, so my, my molecules can understand. I trust God. I don't care. I trust God. I don't care what it looked like. I don't care what it feel like. I don't care what the people say. You're not going to make me not trust God. You're not going to make me hate. You're not going to make me operate from a place that, that's anything less than love. You're not going to force me to be living in fear. I will not. God has brought me too far. He has done too much. He has reconstructed my entire being to the place where I get to stand up, suit up, show up, get it done, get it done to the best of my ability and oh, oh by the way impact lives while it's getting done so that not just my life has changed but your life has changed and the people that encounter you their lives are changed and the people that encounter them their life is changed there's a ripple effect by the 11 step that I have lived what God has done with me and I am grateful beyond description there are no English words in the dictionary to express the level of gratitude that I live live and walk with and how I engage with others. 
Well, I just had to take a moment. I, I didn't mean to go to church on y'all, but it's like, <laughs> whew, that just hit me. Uh, that's my understanding though. And, and my prayers are very, very simple. I no longer pray, God, give me the house, give me the car, get, you know, fix my kids, you know, get my brother right. Um, and that's not my prayers anymore because I do not know if the, the journey of struggle that my kids and my brothers have to walk is not part of their blessed future. So why would I pray them out of their experience that could be molding them for who God knows they're going to be that I don't? So my prayers are very simple. All I ask is, what is your will in the moment that I'm standing in? Because that's the only place I have access to God in my present, right where I'm standing. The real estate I own is the real estate I'm standing on. That's it. That's all. If I can keep my focus keyed in on where I'm standing, I will always have access to God at the time that I need him. Because I only really, really need him in the moment I'm standing there. What's fitting to happen tomorrow, what used to happen yesterday, no longer matters. It does not matter. I can only affect change right, right here, right now. So my only prayer is knowledge for his will for me in the moment I'm standing in and the power to carry that out in the moment I'm standing in. And so my question, my indicators, because sometimes I can't decipher because there's so many people talking in my head. So in, in those moments when I can't decipher the voices, I ask for indicators. What are the indicators? And then I raise up, I look around, and I see what's around me. You know, if there may be a billboard, there may be a license plate, there may be a commercial on TV. And if I'm keyed in, in the moment I'm standing in, <clears throat> I will hear, <laughs> I will hear an indicator of the best course of action to take for the moment I'm standing in. Living like that, living like that has gotten me through this pandemic, this social injustice, this political chaos. Um, and I released my job March 9th. I, I had a five city tour planned. I, I launched a new business that this year. And I, I was, I was, you know, I was I was I packed up my, my show and I was taking it on the road. And and I and I released my job and we had a very emotional goodbye. You know, they made cake and they hugged me and you know, we cried and I said goodbye to them. I gave them all their stuff. They said goodbye to me and gave me the rest of my stuff. And and I came home and I was like, okay, mom, I'm gonna do this. I finally have the courage. And a week later, uh, we they shut the they shut they, they shut down the world. I was like, whoa. I was like, God, you knew that was coming, right? You, you, what, you want to go tell me? You, 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 I can at least keep my little paycheck until we got through this. Guy was like, no, you would have never done it. I'm like, oh, okay, I see what you did there. I see, I see what you did, but that's all right. That's all right. If you got me, then you're going to have to have me because I got nothing else now. <laughs> and, um, and God has cared. I've made more money in these last five, six months than I made all last year. Without, I haven't even got clients yet. I, I, I got three clients. I just started. I trust God over anything I may think and anything y'all may say. Because my experience with the 11th step is that God is more reliable than anything else I've ever been introduced to. And if I stick to it, <laughs> all our lives will change. <laughs> because everything I do, I don't just do for me. I do because I am called to the purpose. My feet have called, been called to the carpet. Um, on behalf of everyone that comes into my path. Where am I at in time, you guys? It's about time. And on a note, it's going to be perfect. 
Okay, uh, see how God did that? Because I don't have no clock, I don't know nothing. And that's how reliable he is. And it's like, I ain't got to keep up with nothing because God got it. He see it, he know it. But in closing, I just want to say, I am so appreciative. I, I, was, I was a little nervous. <laughs> but I don't get to not show up, ever. I don't ever get to not show up. And, 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 and the one thing I'm clear on is when I do show up in whatever condition I'm in, when I show up, the only thing people see when, they, when, they, when their eyes uh, land on me is the covering of God and what he has done in my life. And so you too can have that experience. Work the steps. Um, don't do it alone. Um, uh, trust God. It works. Thank you so much for letting me share.